Hey, this is Paul Durbin. I'm the pastor of Belay Church in Boulder, Colorado, and this is our podcast. I pray today's content equips you to reach higher heights and help others do the same. Thanks so much for joining us today. What is it about Jesus in me that gives me hope? Because if the Christian faith could be summed up in one word, I believe hope would be a very strong candidate. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's fascinating that these words were written down by a guy named Paul, because no one could predict that someone like him would ever write, Christ in me or Christ in you is the hope of glory. Why? Because Paul hadn't always been Paul. He used to be a guy named Saul, and Saul was a guy that hunted down, killed, or imprisoned every Christian he could find. But all that changed when he met Jesus. The Bible tells us in Acts 9 that Jesus appeared to Saul, knocked him off his horse. Saul was then born again, baptized, called into the ministry, and began going by the name Paul. Why the new name? Well, think about this. The name Saul in Hebrew is spelled exactly like the Hebrew word for hell. The only difference in the two words is their pronunciation. It's like the English word that the words that we spell P-R-E-S-E-N-T. Is it present or present? We only know based on the context. It's the same with the Hebrew words for Saul and hell. So think of Saul before he met Jesus. He probably kind of liked his name. I'm sure it helped to have a threatening looking name when you did the things that he did. But it wasn't cool to the new Paul who now had Jesus in him. The name Paul means small or little, which is exactly what happened when Paul opened his heart and he let Jesus in. Paul became small, but the Jesus in him became big. He was no longer all about scaring and intimidating people. Paul wanted to offer others the same hope he found in Jesus. With that backdrop in mind, I'd like to read Acts chapter 23. Now, by the time of this chapter, the Saul that was famous for hunting people down was being hunted down himself. Saul's old friends didn't like the new Paul, so in chapter 23, they bring him before a jury of his colleagues, a group of people called the Sanhedrin. Let's look at that now. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate that law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from the Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that um, there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, stood up and argued vigorously, We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away, take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Here's what I want you to see. When Jesus came into Saul's life, a man whose name and heart both looked like hell, he discovered three realities that gave him an unshakable hope. Here's the first reality. Paul learned that Jesus in me sets me free. If you and I are having a confrontation of some sort, And I ask you a pointed question such as, Hey, did you steal money from my wallet? If you answer with your head down and your eyes shifting about saying, Yeah, right, like uh, I'd take your wallet. I might not believe you because your body language is saying, Yep, it was definitely me. However, if you look me straight in the eye and say, Absolutely not. 
it's more likely that I'll believe you. Now, did you catch how Paul responded to his colleagues? The Bible says, Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. This would have been confusing to the guys of the Sanhedrin because they figured Paul was guilty no matter how you looked at it. First, from their perspective, Paul hadn't fulfilled his duty. He was supposed to stop Jesus' followers, but instead he'd become a Jesus follower. So to them, he failed. Second, from a Christian perspective, they'd figure he ought to feel guilty for all the Christians he'd persecuted before becoming a Christian himself. Either way, the Sanhedrin would never expect Paul to look them in the eyes and say, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience. Or put another way, my brothers, I am completely guilt-free. They'd be like, what? How do you figure that, Paul? But make no mistake, Paul hasn't forgotten that he had once been Saul. He once wrote to his young apprentice, Timothy, I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. Paul knew where he had come from, but he also understood that he'd been set free because he also wrote to Timothy, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Someone listening or watching this today needs to understand that when Jesus moves in, he forever sets you free. He clears your conscience. He forgives your past. You don't have to walk around in shame anymore. You can raise your head and look people in the eye because you have a God who loves you, who gave his life for you and has forever set you free. Here's the second reality that gave Paul hope. Jesus in me gives me life. In Paul's day, there were certain contentious issues, just as there are today. You know, things you you shouldn't say around certain company. One of those contentious issues of Paul's day was the afterlife. Some of his colleagues believed in the afterlife. They were called Pharisees. Other colleagues didn't believe in the afterlife. They were called Sadducees. Now, most of us try to avoid sensitive topics, but not Paul. Watch what he does in verse 6. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial today because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out. Now, how could Paul stand in front of this crowd that wanted to kill him and declare such fighting words? It's because Paul wasn't afraid of death. He had the hope of the resurrection life living inside him. And that's what Jesus in me does. It fills me with resurrection life and hope. A hope that says, even when this body dies, I know it will be raised back to life. We're told in Romans chapter 8, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Jesus in Paul gave Paul hope. Jesus in me gives me hope. Jesus in you gives you hope. Now here's the third reality that gave Paul hope. Paul learned that Jesus in me watches my back. For this point, I'd like us to take a look at the rest of Acts 23. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about this case. We are ready to kill him before he gets there. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner sent me, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it you want to tell me? 
He said, Some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them, because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning, Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, Get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows, Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency, Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to the Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you. I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers carrying out the orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day they left the cavalry to go on with them while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Sicilia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Did you notice the progression of miracles that took place in order to spare Paul's life? First, Paul's nephew hears about a plot to kill Paul, which is amazing. How did Paul's nephew get to hear of this plot? Second, Paul's nephew has the opportunity to report this information to the Roman commander. And how did that come about? I doubt just anyone could speak to a Roman commander. Third, the commander cares enough to write a letter to the governor. And when does that happen? Fourth, the commander makes sure Paul gets to Caesarea safely. These things don't happen because of luck, coincidence, and chance. They happen because Paul served a God who orchestrated so-called coincidences so that Paul would be taken care of. And that's the reality of Jesus in me. He watches my back. I love verse 11 of Acts 23, which says, The following night the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. Someone listening or watching today needs to hear Jesus saying, Take courage. I've got more for you to do. Your time is not finished. Until your final day on earth, I've got your back. We started this talk by asking, What is it about Jesus in me that gives me hope? Well, we've discovered three incredible realities that give us hope in Acts chapter 23. First, Jesus in me sets me free. If that's true, and it is, then stop punishing yourself for something Jesus has already forgiven you for. Second, Jesus in me gives me life. Someone needs to hear that the days ahead of you are more numerous than the days behind you. If you trust in Jesus, your life has just begun. You've got another 10,000 billion years to go, and even that's just the beginning. In Jesus, you have eternal resurrection life and hope living inside of you. It's time to tap into that. Third, Jesus in me watches my back. You're not going through life depending on luck and chance. God has you in his hand. He's watching over you and directing your life. Thanks again for joining us today. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can subscribe, share it with your friends, and visit us online at belay.church or on social media at belaychurch. Let's reach higher heights and help others do the same.